The Joseph Smith Papers team have produced 21 volumes on the life and mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. Each of these represents the documents tied to the mission and ministry of Joseph Smith. They are an effort to collect, interpret, and then present those documents to an inquisitive public who wants to better understand the man and his mission. This latest Joseph Smith Papers volume, now available, is Documents Volume 11. Documents Volume 11 of the Joseph Smith Papers focuses on September 1842 through February 1843. It's a very important period in Joseph Smith's life. It's, it's a tumultuous time. Joseph Smith has more responsibilities than ever. His family responsibilities, his church responsibilities, his role as editor of the church's newspaper, The Times and Seasons, you know, his civic duties as the mayor of Nauvoo, all these are on his plate. And what makes it even harder than ever for him to fulfill these responsibilities is that this time Missouri is once again trying to extradite him back to that state. And Joseph knows that if Missouri brings him back across the border, that would be the end of his life. And so it's in this time period that Joseph's really struggling to figure out how to handle all these responsibilities he's taken on, but also preserving his life so that he can continue to lead the church. So this is a, a really remarkable um, period of time. You see Joseph in a lot of roles. You see him in this volume functioning as a mayor uh, in leading the city council. You see him functioning as the president of the church, obviously. You see him functioning as someone who is arrested and standing before a court to have uh, to have matters considered before a court. You see him as a teacher, um, and then you see him also in, in various uh, places as a judge, uh, presiding over courts and determining matters for himself, ironically at the same time as, he, as his own legal standing is still in question. So it's a, a unique period of time where you get to look at Joseph Smith Toward the end of the volume, you, you get to see him in a number of land transactions and, and deals, um, some of which are quite significant. Um, and just how, how many roles Joseph Smith is trying to manage in 1842 and 1843, um, it's, a, it's a terrific volume and, and there's a lot to learn. But I think if you look at the, the development of Nauvoo, when the city government is first installed, Joseph Smith doesn't seek the mayor's office. He's fine letting somebody else do it. He takes a seat on the, on the city council, but he's not looking to have all civic power rested in him. Um, and, and it's my suspicion, or, or it would appear, that John C. Bennett and, and that whole affair of him leaving and the nature of his resignation um, may have, have caused Joseph Smith to think uh, in terms of this big holy project of the, of the building up of Nauvoo, it may have been difficult for him to once again trust somebody else to do it. I think Joseph Smith throughout his life, throughout his ministry, is delegating power, um, but often when someone has disappointed him in a significant way, uh, his natural impulse might be to bring some of that power back unto him, not, not in this desire to have all the power, but in this view that the city of Nauvoo is so important. It's so important that it has to be done right. And maybe in this instance, the way to do that is to be in control. I think it's easy for critics to look and, say, and see a megalomaniac, to see somebody that has to have all the power. Um, but if you look closely, that's not what's happening at all. Joseph Smith, in many instances, is delegating the power. And it seems to be that mainly in instances where uh, the stakes are too high to fail. Uh, that's when he is insisting on being in the lead on those things. We see Nauvoo beginning to fulfill the promise that Joseph had made, that if people come there, it will become the greatest city in the world. But it wasn't enough just to declare it and for people to move. Uh, Joseph Smith and the city council had to do the work. 
to make Nauvoo a beautiful place. If you do not have the city ordinances, if you do not have rules and regulations in the city, it could be the biggest city in the world, but it will never be the most beautiful or the greatest city in the world. In Documents Volume 11, we have the discourse Joseph Smith gave to a newly arrived group of immigrants uh, down by the dock in Nauvoo. This group of converts coming from New York uh, had just arrived in the city and were being introduced to the city by church leaders. And what he does is he welcomes the people to Nauvoo, but he also tries to help guide their expectations. He lets them know that some people have come to Nauvoo and been disappointed because they expected all things to essentially be perfect. They expected the city to be essentially the city that Joseph Smith had said it would be, but they come to find a city in progress. They also come and meet Joseph Smith and the other brethren who lead the church for the first time. And some of them are disappointed because in their minds they've built these people up to be more than men. And so what Joseph Smith says to these new converts coming from New York is, I will not expect perfection of you if you do not expect perfection of me. So Joseph Smith in February 1842 purchases the Nauvoo printing office and along with it the Times and Seasons, which is the church's newspaper. So starting with the March 1st, 1842 issue, Joseph Smith, in addition to his civic responsibilities, in addition to his ecclesiastical responsibilities and his family responsibilities, Joseph Smith has taken on the editorship of a newspaper. Uh, and he is engaged with it, and he's, uh, he's engaged with the process of printing and editing the newspaper. He also enlists the help of John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff, uh, who bring a lot of experience to, to the printing shop. And, and so as the life of the paper goes on throughout 1842, Joseph Smith's involved to varying extents as he's pulled away for other responsibilities, he relies increasingly on Woodruff and Taylor to handle the day-to-day -day affairs of the newspaper. He's relying on Woodruff, he's relying on Taylor, um, but he is the editor. His name appears in the paper as editor and he understands that he is responsible for the material published in that newspaper. And ultimately, we see that he recognizes it's too much. And if something has to go, the editorship of the Times and Seasons is one of the first to go. Uh, the newspaper is still really important to church membership, to church membership both in Nauvoo, but this newspaper gets sent throughout the United States and, and even to England. Uh, and so this is an important publication of the church for the church. And so what he does is he leases the printing shop and the Times and Seasons to John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff, his trusty editorial assistants his apostles, um, they take on full-time the responsibility of managing and editing the Times and Seasons. And Joseph Smith's uh, valedictory, his, his farewell, his resignation, appears in the November 15th, 1842 issue of the Times and Seasons. And, and, that's close, and, and that closes his uh, short-lived editorial career. The major story of this volume centers around attempts made to extradite Joseph Smith back to Missouri. In 1842, May of 1842, an attempt was made on the life of former Missouri Governor Lilburn W. Boggs. Well, he survived the attack and swore out an affidavit that he believed that Joseph Smith and Porter Rockwell had conspired to kill him. That led to the efforts to get Joseph back to Missouri. Joseph understood that if he went back to Missouri, his death was certain. The date was September 1842. He was at home having a meal and the sheriffs that were attempting to arrest him appeared at the door. They spoke with former apostle John Boynton um, who was in Nauvoo, and Boynton and Emma Smith distracted the sheriffs while Joseph snuck out the back door, snuck through a cornfield, and went to the home of Newell K. Whitney. He stayed at the home of Newell K. Whitney until it was dark, and then that night was 
taken to the home of Edward Hunter, where he hid upstairs on the upper floor for several days, hiding from September 3rd to September 10th, 1842. No one in Nauvoo, other than a few select people, knew Joseph's location. He couldn't go outside, he couldn't leave the home of, of Brother Hunter, he couldn't even go downstairs. You get insights into how he managed the personal trials that he was going through. The need to constantly be in and out of hiding, uh, being in someone else's house, even having to leave Nauvoo for a time. We don't have much from Joseph during these moments, but the things that we do have uh, include wonderful little analogies as he talks about feeling like a fish out of water if he didn't have persecutions. Uh, feeling the need to go into hiding, not only to protect himself, but to protect his family and to protect the saints as a whole. Uh, you get these insights into, into his character. I think one of the most triumphant moments in Joseph's life ironically comes as he's sitting in hiding at the home of Edward Hunter. And he writes this wonderful phrase, shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward, not backward, and on, on to the victory. Um, a few lines later, or a few lines earlier, he had said, what do we hear? A voice of gladness. And so that gives you an interesting insight into who Joseph Smith was as a person. It was while Joseph was secluded in the cramped attic story of the home of Edward Hunter there in Nauvoo that the joyful lines mentioned above were penned. The whole of that letter details the solemn matters of the salvation of the human family. On September 7th, William Clayton came to visit Joseph at the home of Edward Hunter. And Joseph's diary records that that afternoon he dictated a lengthy letter to the saints uh, through William Clayton. This letter, which is now Doctrine and Covenants section 128, provided these additional instructions that Joseph had promised to give to the saints. As you read through this section, the first several verses are all about the process of record keeping. The rest of that letter is fascinating. It talks about the importance of these records. As I had said, Joseph says, you may think that this is very particular. But he then explains that by keeping these records, what was recorded on earth was then recorded in the heavens. And that this was a way that we would bind ourselves to our dead. He explained that the doctrine of baptism for the dead created a welding link between ourselves and our generations. And that this welding link was necessary not only for our dead to be made perfect, but for we ourselves to be made perfect. So that neither they nor we could be made perfect without each other. In December, as this extradition attempt has been ongoing for months, Joseph sends a delegation of his closest supporters and friends, including Willard Richards, William Clayton, and Hiram Smith, to Springfield, Illinois, to meet with governor, uh, to meet with um, government authorities to try and come to some kind of agreement or arrangement. The delegation quickly meets with Supreme, State Supreme Court Justice Stephen A. Douglas. They meet with prominent attorney Justin Butterfield, and Butterfield arranges for a meeting with the newly elected Governor Thomas Ford. And all of these authorities read through the documents of the case, and all of them agree that if Joseph travels to Springfield, Illinois, he could be released with a writ of habeas corpus to the State Supreme Court. Joseph determines that he will submit to the law with that plan. He allows himself to be arrested and they journey to Springfield, Illinois. When they get to Illinois, rather than petition the uh, state Supreme Court, Justin Butterfield 
their attorney, Joseph's attorney, says, you know, I'm licensed to practice before the federal court. And I think the federal circuit court is actually the proper venue for this uh, hearing. So instead of going before the state court, they go before the federal court. Joseph very quickly obtains a writ of habeas corpus and they plan for a hearing. We know that there's unprecedented interest in Joseph Smith's hearing. When, for example, when Joseph's hearing is heard on the 4th and 5th of January, the room is completely crowded. In fact, for the first time, the federal court agrees to allow women to attend a court session, which has not been previously allowed, but the only space for them was on the bench with the judge. And so you had Judge Nathaniel Pope on the bench, surrounded by the most prominent uh, women in Springfield, the wives and daughters of all of the prominent politicians and lawyers in the city, including a newly married Mary Todd Lincoln, who's in attendance. They all want to try and see Joseph and be part of this big moment that they know is uh, taking place in this tiny courtroom in Springfield. Um, it's there one of the greatest stories in Illinois legal history gets told of the legend of Justin Butterfield's opening remarks. Well, one newspaper in Illinois says that Butterfield stood up faced Judge Nathaniel Pope, faced the women on the bench, and then said, I arise under the most extraordinary circumstances in this age and country, religious as it is. I appear before the Pope, supported on either hand by angels, to defend the prophet of the Lord. This story gets told and handed down in Springfield and Illinois lore and becomes quite legendary and embellished over the years. So for example, in a book about the Illinois bar, the author remembers that, um, true or not, Butterfield arrived in his most brilliant blue jacket and his most brilliant coat uh, had uh, polished metal buttons and knew that this was a moment of great theater and stood up and said, May it please the court, I appear before you today under circumstances most novel and peculiar. I am to address the Pope, bowing to the judge, surrounded by angels, bowing still lower to the ladies, in the presence of holy apostles, in behalf of the prophet of the Lord. Butterfield's argument was twofold. One, he said that uh, Lilburn W. Boggs' affidavit didn't actually charge Joseph with a crime, which was true. Boggs in his affidavit said that he believed Joseph was guilty of being an accessory before the fact to his attempted assassination. But a belief is not a legal charge. You can't arrest someone just based on a belief without any evidence. And so Butterfield said the writ is insufficient. When Missouri's governor wrote to the governor of Illinois and asked for Joseph to be arrested, the requisition form said that Joseph Smith was a fugitive from justice and had fled from Missouri. Butterfield pointed out, Joseph hasn't been in Missouri since 1839. Joseph literally has not fled from Missouri, so how can you call him a fugitive from justice who has fled from Missouri? Uh, Nathaniel Pope, after a two-day hearing, agrees and discharged Joseph. Uh, says Joseph is not a fugitive from justice, so he, we, he cannot be arrested and extradited, and also says that Lilburn Boggs' affidavit is fatally defective and that no one can be arrested on an affidavit that is so poorly constructed. And so based on this, Joseph is set free. He's able to return to Nauvoo. And this is, I think, probably one of the greatest moments of Joseph's life. He has just been surrounded by all of the who's who of Illinois and has just had the greatest legal victory of his life. Joseph is free and he and his supporters are ecstatic. They are celebratory and we know they are singing songs and partying all of the way back to Nauvoo. In fact, the day after Joseph arrives in Nauvoo, he plans a party, a jubilee party. They have a day of fasting and celebration throughout the city. 
President Smith said the church never had so good a prospect before them as at the present time. That's a letter from Willard Richards to Levi Richards on 11 January 1840, uh, 1843. This seems like the beginning of a brighter future for Joseph. And so our volume, Documents Volume 11, ends on a high note. Joseph has been found free, or has been set free. Uh, his legal troubles seem like they're going to be behind him, and it's just going to be success to him and the church, as far as they can see, for the future. One of the great and lasting benefits of the Joseph Smith Papers is the details. Competent and highly trained historians gather, organize, and interpret documents on Joseph's life and ministry. Documents that range from the mundane of a city ordinance to the eternal, a letter on baptism for the dead, and then present those documents to us in a manner that we can understand. And those who choose to can judge for themselves who Joseph Smith really was. We live in a marvelous time indeed. I'm Glenn Rawson, and thank you. <laughs>